to determine you know, what constitutes a proper fit and what constitutes proper protection. So uh, in terms of eyewear, we want to ensure that the eyewear has a comfortable fit, obviously with no distortion or blocked vision. Um, we also want to ensure that the workers are putting on the eyewear before the exposure to the hazard, which is, you know, unfortunately often not the case. Um, maybe someone has taken off their uh, eye protection and then started using a tool, for example, a grinding tool, and it's not, you know, until it's too late that they realize that they forgot to put their eye protection back on. Um, cleaning and disposing of the eye protection when it's scratched or damaged uh, is, a, is what needs to happen. Uh, the good thing about a lot of the eye protection that we purchase, it's a lot like the ear protection. It's in bulk and, uh, you know, just like you heard, we do the same thing. We have, uh, uh, you know, the tinted safety glasses uh, for daytime operations and then just the clear safety glasses for nighttime or l low light operations. And then, you know, in, in our industry, if people want to augment those with their own uh, safety certified sunglasses, that's fine. But you know, we're providing as an employer an adequate level of PPE initially. Um, breathing, you know, the respirators, as I mentioned, uh, there is a process involved with those. You need to have, you know, medical approval, first of all. Uh, you have to be fit tested. Um, they have to be inspected before each use and including a seal check and that's got to be documented and then they've got to be properly cleaned and stored and there are a lot of criteria associated with those. So just remember that if you run into a situation where you hear of respirators, there's um, totally different standards basically that apply to those. Hearing, obviously we want to choose a protection uh, that's adequate for the noise level. So for example, each different type of hearing protection protects to a different level typically. And we want to ensure that the level we're providing employees or that they're utilizing is commensurate with the level of exposure or risk that they have, okay? Um, correctly prepare and insert the earplugs. It depends on the exact style. There are numerous different ways to properly insert the earplugs so that A, they get a good fit and they provide the correct level of protection, but B, they don't get inserted too far and have to be, you know, medically or quasi-medically with a, a pair of pliers on the side of the road from a coworker removed, um, which does happen. So uh, that's important though. People often forget that on earplugs to, you know, they think they can just stuff them in their ears. But if, if they look, there's typically instructions on the different styles about, you know, how to properly insert them and to ensure that you do get a proper fit but not insert them too far. Uh, head protection, you know, we talked about hard hats already quite a bit, but what's most important is to ensure that the employee has a comfortable fit and that they inspect, like the rest of their PPE, that they inspect every, you know, every time they use it. Before each use, they inspect it for damage, you know, cracks, wear, tear, anything that's going to degrade the level of protection that that PPE is supposed to provide them. Uh, another thing that is really important is keeping their PPE cleaned, especially their hard hat. I know that's hard in a lot of environments because it's easy for people's hard hats to get really dirty. And in, in some ways, uh, you know, maybe it's a source of pride in a lot of industries for, you know, if someone's been there a long time and they've got their, uh, you know, it's a way for them to express their personal character, I guess, and, you know, stickers or the number of uh, uh, battle scars or what, you know, whatever, however you want to look at it, there's a certain amount of issue there. But uh, it's important to keep those hard hats clean because, when they're kept clean, it's easier to see that damage and replace them when they need to be replaced so that they're still providing an adequate level of protection. Footwear, obviously we want to ensure that footwear is a proper fit and comfort and you know often that's going to be something that's at the sole determination of the employee. We can't look obviously at someone's footwear and tell you if it's comfortable to you, but um, we just want to ensure that they have a comfortable fit though and that they're wearing the proper footwear, that they're not uh, needlessly exposing themselves to hazards if they've got cracks or holes or excessive wear, that sort of thing. And obviously, same thing with the boots. Boots are kind of like the hard hats. It's really difficult to keep them clean, but an effort should be made to keep them clean so that you can see uh, the level of wear that they have or see if they have any damage and ensure that they are providing the level of protection that's intended. Hands and shirt gloves have a comfortable fit. Uh, inspect before each use like all other PPE. Keep clean and dry. That's often easier said than done as well. Um, but it's important to keep those dry so you don't have uh, you know, any needless long-term exposure to your employees from 
um, you know, working wet equipment, and then also just be aware that, as we mentioned before, there are different types of gloves for different types of tasks, and we need to make sure that we're using the appropriate glove uh, for the appropriate tasks. All right, so uh, with that, I think we're uh, about through with the units. I know it was much sooner than expected. It helps having uh, a, uh, such a small class, makes it go a lot, lot smoother and a lot quicker. Um, you know, before we kind of look at what we need to do to wrap up here in terms of finishing up your finals, and I think uh, Victoria has some evaluations for you. Are there any other questions that you guys have or any other points? On, uh, going back to what you had talked about before on uh, the loose clothing, uh -huh. does that apply to jeans as well? Because in the past we had issues with people using baggy pants. Mm -hmm. You know, there with the skill saw or quickie saw, we had mm -hmm. issues where someone ended up cutting their leg, mm -hmm. you know, does that, that's something that we should be enforcing and making mm -hmm. sure because it's something that we ignore at times. Mm -hmm. with that. Well, I think that there's not going to, I mean, we're not going to find a standard for the bagginess of the gene because it's hard to quantify. I mean, if we can go out there and measure the diameter of someone's pant leg, but yeah, I think it boils down to, um, you know, the, you, your company, if, if, if you feel that it constitutes a safety issue, then yeah, I think something definitely needs, you know, should be done about it. If, if you feel that, that, you know, employees' pants are so baggy that they might be causing a hazard with a skill saw, for example, then, then yeah, it might, might be time to implement a policy that says, um, you know, crew superintendents will have the sole authority to determine, you know, if uh, a tire uh, it constitutes a safety hazard, you know, or something to that effect. Sense. Well, mm -hmm. it's unfortunate. But a lot of people <laughs> don't have any. Come, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it seems to be a rarity lately. So, what is the employer's responsibility? Do you offer training when new employees come on? Do you offer it once a quarter to your mm -hmm. whole uh, team? Mm -hmm. um, if you catch somebody who repeatedly doesn't wear the provided equipment, do you put a warning in their personnel mm -hmm. file? I, I'm, it seems to me that the individual mm -hmm. is responsible for a lot of choice on mm -hmm. the job site. Mm -hmm. You can't be there all the time, mm -hmm. but your company is responsible for workers' comp and mm -hmm. everything else. So mm -hmm. what's... Well, we're in a really unique industry, so I'm not sure that... Um, it might not be a good comparison to mm -hmm. compare our industry to others, but... Um, yeah, I mean, I think ultimately the the burden does lie with each employee, but uh, you know, obviously, if there are repercussions, it's going to fall back on the employer. So, you know, for us personally, there are PPE-related issues that um, they're not negotiable, but uh, can be resolved. You know, through uh, you know, maybe just having a discussion. You know, without any documentation, that sort of thing. And then there are certain. PPE issues that are a complete no-go for us. You know, I'll uh, give you an example. You know, if someone uh, has their sleeves rolled up when they're not supposed to or they don't have their gloves on, I mean, that's not going to be a deal breaker for us. N we're not saying that that PPE is negotiable. It needs to be worn all the time, and, and the crew supervisors know that. Um, but there are other issues, you know, where if someone didn't wear a piece of required PPE, then, you know, it's, it's a complete no-go in our industry. I mean, they'll, they'll be gone. But we, we don't have to deal with that a whole lot. But, yeah, it is a tricky situation because, you know, like you're saying, it's the common sense uh, resides with the employee and that the decision, the conscious decision to wear the PPE that they're supposed to or not resides with the employee. But ultimately, the repercussions fall on the employer. So, um, yeah, it is a tricky situation. I think it's incumbent upon the employer to do everything possible to ensure that people are being safe out there, to give them the PPE they need, give them the proper training, and, and then set up some kind of a system, whatever it is, that fits their industry or their uh, corporate culture to ensure that people are actually following the rules. I mean, it's one thing to have a set of rules in place, and then it's another thing to actually follow the rules, right? Where you go on the on the job site, or is it something that it, it's like in their personnel manual, and and mm -hmm. they're supposed to read it on their own? But um, well, both. But I think what's important for us, and I would imagine this is the same for other companies, is if the employees understand the consequences, then they have a vested interest in the company, and they'll want to wear their PPE. 
for example, you know, uh, our employees know that you know, if, if you're not wearing your PPE and you're injured, our workers' comp insurance is, first of all, not going to pay for your injury. Second of all, we're in a very difficult to insure industry and we might lose our workers' comp. You know, basically, you not wearing your PPE could put us out of business and not only will you not have a job, all your buddies won't have a job. And that really hits home with our folks because, um, you know, people are vested and they understand like, oh man, if I choose to not wear my PPE and I get hurt, there's going to be repercussions not only on myself, but on everyone. And they, they don't want that burden on themselves. It's just easier to go through the inconvenience of wearing the PPE to, uh, to ensure that, you know, they're following the rules for everyone's benefit, not just their own or the, or the owners. bonuses at the end of the year mm -hmm. you know they get an accident they just yep. lost that bonus yep. the safety bonus and that motivates a lot of the, the foremans and the employees yep. absolutely and yep. our contractors are supposed to conduct a weekly safety meeting mm -hmm. with their employees and document that mm -hmm. each week mm -hmm. so they're supposed to have an orientation with their new employees mm -hmm. on safety and mm -hmm. EEO um, do you guys provide the safety topics um, are there suggested topics, or is there like an industry standard? A AGC mm -hmm. will have all the topics ready for them, mm -hmm. and all they do is they talk about whatever they're going to be working on that week. Mm -hmm. So if they're working, you know, welding or whatever, they'll have a topic on welding. If they're mm -hmm. working fall protection, they'll mm -hmm. have something on that. Mm -hmm. Trenching, they'll have something on that. Mm -hmm. Chemicals, they always have something on that. So it, mm -hmm. you know, it just depends on what they're they're really getting into the area of work, and that's what they really need to be mm -hmm. discussing that week. But then, yeah. you know, there's generic topics out there, too, that talk about safety gear, mm -hmm. just general safety. And I, I think that's common, Victoria, for a lot of industries. Um, there are sources for those safety topics. Um, you know, for example, we, we have what we call six minutes. So every day in our daily, you know, briefings, we go through a, a six minutes for safety topic that is industry standard. Everyone goes over, and it's just on an annual calendar, and it's rotating different topics that you might come across. So I, I think that those sort of things are pretty common. Obviously, it sounds like yeah, for other industries too. Anderson safety and mm -hmm. that's where they get everything, so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even us as a school, we have to provide training as a school. Uh, we have the form that the go government sends us mm -hmm. every year that we have to say, mm -hmm. we have provided this amount of training mm -hmm. for our staff. Mm -hmm. And it's regulated yeah. every year. So. Well, when I was at Rose State, I had to certify in CPR and, and um, first aid every year. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess all the professors have to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of uh, companies have to provide hazardous communication training at a very minimum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I think that, I mean, obviously I have a biased opinion, you know, coming from a fire service background, but I think um, you, you know, I don't see a reason why everyone in every industry shouldn't have CPR and first aid and AED training. I mean, I think that ought to be a necessity for any industry, um, public or private, but um, it certainly helps people's survival rates when unexpected things happen. That's Even for sure. when they're not on the job. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So you can use that training at home. Absolutely. Fire extinguisher training, CPR, yep. if something should happen to a family member, absolutely. you're out on the highway. Yeah, that's a and in my case, as a smaller company, yep. I guess what I'd like to leave with once I leave is, you know, resources. Is yeah. what right now, who do I need to contact? You yeah. know, being a smaller company, I knew you didn't mention the AGC, but in my case, who would we, would we have to go through ComSource or mm -hmm. to have, you know, safety meetings and how to do this, it the right way? Or do, you, do you have ComSource for your... Yes. Um, that was the first, we, we've had, my, just personally, my company, we've had two different um, safety plans slash hazard assessments um, created for us. And the second was through what I mentioned earlier, a consultant, we had a grant, it was through the career tech system. The first was through CompSource. They have spa safety specialists. Have you dealt with them at all yet? Yeah, I, I talked to one before, but yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, they'll come out and do a safety plan for you. Granted, the one they do is pretty generic, but it's a start. And then also uh, they have, I think they might have transitioned online recently, but for a while when we first started in business, we were using a bunch of these. They have a DVD library of safety training videos that you can check out for free. They'll mail them to you. You can keep them for any length of time. Usually we would keep them a couple weeks and then mail them back and, uh, and it's totally free. I mean, it's included within the cost of your policy, so. And documentation is good too, just anytime Absolutely. you need a meeting. 
um, or they, you know, that's when we want them to sign off on it, just to show, hey, you know, we've been, you know, they've been going to safety meetings, or you've been conducting safety meetings and things like that. The documentation is really important. And it's hard when you're out on a work site, obviously, to get that. But um, that's one thing you know that we'll do. We'll print that um, daily safety topic, incorporate it into our daily briefing, basically our tailgate safety section, and just get everyone to sign and date it. So that yeah, I mean, if we come back and we have a contract compliance issue, or if we have a safety issue, someone is injured, um, we can say you know, hey, we we were we were doing our part, and, and we were providing that employee with the information they needed to work safely. And you know, here's their signature on our daily tailgate safety briefings on those topics so but yeah I would reach out if you haven't been working with Victoria and Judy yeah, I would definitely do that they've been huge resources for us for my small business to help us find access um, because it it is hard it's really hard when you're a very small business because we're a very small business and um, the regulatory compliance issues can often be overwhelming especially when you have limited financial resources. I mean, if you had unlimited financial resources, we would put all of our employees through weeks or months worth of every possible training they could need, but you kind of have to find ways to be in innovative and creative and adaptive to um, you know, still do business and stay in business as a very small business, but provide people with the training they need so that you feel that they're being safe out there and they're well prepared. Well, and don't forget some of the free sources like um, Red Cross. Actually, I think they charge now for some, but but you can rent videos mm -hmm. and and get information from different places like mm -hmm. that that would constitute a safety meeting component. Mm -hmm. You know, basic first aid mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. And and doesn't OSHA do some training too, or at least provide material? Oh, they provide a lot of written guidance, yeah. I think, on their website. Mm -hmm. uh, what I was thinking about uh, when you first said OSHA was that the State Department of Safety provides some assistance. I know that they'll do um, inspections, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. at least they used to. They called the program SHARP, mm -hmm. where they would come out and uh, basically do a walkthrough and write up what their recommendations were. And you were guaranteed, if you asked them in to do that, that you would not get cited. Exactly. Mm -hmm. that, <laughs> that all they would do mm -hmm. is give you some helpful. Yeah, I think even some advice. fire departments mm -hmm. have safety training crews, you know, come, that will come out and give you free uh, training. Mm -hmm. Yep. Just got just to dig them up, dig up those sources. So, but there are two good resources for you right there, Judy and Victoria, for sure. As long as you're creating new jobs. What is that? I'm not familiar with it. Uh, it's training for industry program, mm -hmm. uh, and there are a lot of uh, requirements. But if you're creating new jobs, you might qualify for that, and it would help it's a grant. the cost. I see. It's a grant yeah. provided through the the government provides the grant through Career Tech. I see. And then we can take that training to the companies mm -hmm. and train them specifically as to what mm -hmm. their company needs. I see. That might have been what we used on that sa the safety plan, I'm not sure. But yeah, just gotta dig them up. Just gotta be, be relentless and when you're small and hustling and finding those opportunities where um, you know pe people can help you and there's not a big outlay of cash that, you know, because you're not a big corporation and you can't do that, so. What else, do you guys have any, anything else? Questions, comments? you can think of? No. The only thing I can think of out there is uh, the colors, uh -huh. orange, yellow, and green. Uh -huh. Your type one, two, and three pests types. Uh -huh. I'm not familiar with those at all. Could, could you I don't know, that's comment on you. those for the <laughs> lane? Yeah. Um, a while back we did the type three, which you have to have the, the uh, silver reflective. Uh -huh. And that's kind of what we're having on the job sites right now. Uh -huh. Type one is, you know, just your color vest, uh -huh. nothing on it, no reflective of any kind, mm -hmm. which we don't want those on jobs because uh -huh. you can't see anything. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And what's a type two? Uh, I'm not sure. I got gotcha. you. Um, so I, I guess I maybe I do know a little bit about this. Th this goes back to the regulation that came out maybe like about a year ago. A that green. For uh, why well, is that when you guys switch colors? Is mm -hmm. that Okay, for us, it was a big issue because um, 
you know, if someone was working on a federally funded roadway, um, they had to have a, you know, they had a, a vest on now, reflective vest that required, uh, you know, a certain level of reflective material, right? Is that right? Um, the issue, you know, that we had was, um, you know, we had to go back to uh, the regulatory agency, which I guess would have been DOT, is that right? Or Federal Highway uh, yeah, something? Federal Highway Administration. Administration. Um, and, and let them know that it wouldn't work for us because those vests that they wanted us to wear were not fire retardant. And so that, that was a big issue in our world, but um, that was probably about like a year ago, is that right? Maybe a year and a half? Probably two years ago, yeah. Okay. Um, that's about all, all that I know about it. Basically, it's, all, all that I know is that the requirement changed about a year and a half ago and that it's now more, more stringent um, due to the change in regulations. That's about all I know about it. Yeah, we don't see a lot of orange out there anymore. Uh -huh. I didn't realize that there was a spe uh, the, it specified the color. I, I wasn't aware of that. I thought it just had to do with the square inches of reflective material um, on the vest. But um, so the the orange has pretty much been eliminated. Now it's just the lime yeah, green. Yeah, the lime green is easier to see too. Yeah, that and makes that's sense. That's you want to be seen. Yeah, that's the, be seen, stay alive, right? Mm -hmm. What else? Any anything else? Any other questions or comments? <laughs>